And now it is my great pleasure to introduce somebody who probably here needs no introduction, but Dr. John Oro. Um, he's actually, I don't know how many years we've known each other. Over a decade. Over a decade, okay. <laughs> that, that was diplomatic. <laughs> and uh, he's been an expert in this field for so many years. Um, he's got a kind heart, a great bedside manner, and he's smart. So, um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. John Wardo. Well, thank you, everyone. It's so nice to see such uh, wonderful faces, faces uh, a lot that we've uh, worked together and continue to work together on. And uh, let me also say uh, a word or two about Dorothy. Dorothy and I have known each other for over a decade. Um, she has a lot of experience uh, with the Chiari malformation and has been working to push uh, the understanding forward. And that's led her to become part of this new organization, only four years old, Chiari Syringal Maile Foundation. And watching the various organizations, I've not seen any other organization take off as solidly, as strongly, and as rapidly as Chiari Syringal Maile so, Foundation. So we, uh, we may indeed see a day not too long from now when more and more people throughout the country understand um, Chiari malformation like we know of a muscular dystrophy, let's say, or some other disorder. So I really uh, have to congratulate your efforts. Well, the title today is uh, a little bit different, and uh, I'm going to walk for just a minute. And it's thrown a few folks off as to, well, what do you mean if it's not Chiari, what else could it be? And that's what we're going to try to talk about, and I'll try to explain myself here. Uh, we know what a Chiari malformation in general looks like. We also should know that one Chiari malformation is, one person's Chiari is not the same as another person's Chiari. They're really very variable. And so trying to compare your outcome with someone else's, it's, it's tough to do because basically, again, it varies. This is a, an actual fairly uh, severe Chiari malformation. That brain sim, what you're looking at is the side view of the lower back of the brain cavity and the upper cervical spine. This is bone at the back of the head, it ends there. This is bone at the base of the skull, it ends there. From there to there is the hole at the bottom of the skull. Above that, we have the cerebellum, part of the brain stem. This part of the cerebellum doesn't belong here. The tip of that tissue should be about three millimeters up inside on average. Instead, it's being shoved, if you will, down into this opening. And this lower part of the brainstem is being stretched. And there's, in this case, a fluid collection building up inside the spinal cord, as you all know, is a syrinx or syringomyelia. And so there's so many systems involved. This is like a central computer control area, the brainstem, especially the medulla, that people have a variety of neurological symptoms. And not one person's presentations can be very different from another. One may have the typical explosive or pressure headache in the back. One may just have repetitive vomiting for unknown cause or loss of hearing. So it's a very variable presentation. Now, we have a Chiari that's maybe not as severe, not as impacted, nevertheless still a Chiari malformation. We know this person may have had the Chiari malformation or has had the Chiari malformation all their lives. Why in their mid-30s are they now having symptoms? And then if the symptoms show up, are we sure that the symptoms are due to the Chiari malformation? Okay, so, um, so as we uh, evaluate uh, people with Chiari malformation, we also have to think a little bit widely and say, yes, we see the Chiari malformation, but let's make sure we consider other things that could be going along with the Chiari malformation. And you heard Dorothy use the term comorbidities. That means another disorder that goes along with Chiari. Or to put it another way, having a Chiari malformation doesn't protect us from any other disorder. Okay, so we have to keep things open, and, and what I'm trying to share today is, let's think, why do some people not respond? 
Is it something else that's hidden that we're missing in addition to the Chiari? You've probably seen maybe discussions on the net where a Chiari, the surgery itself looks very good. Things are wide open, but the person is having symptoms. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Okay. Now, fortunately, um, Diane Mueller's here today, and I have to credit um, um, Diane Mueller and Kimberly Sexton for helping me uh, prepare this. They're both nurse practitioners and fairly advanced, as you can see, and it's a real pleasure to work with them as a team, and it really does take a team to do this kind of work. Um, and in our large study of 112 people uh, following their outcome, Diane Mueller took the lead on this study, uh, we showed that 84% reported significant improvement in the quality of their life at one year. And those numbers are fairly what we know from other studies as well. However, some persons may have another condition that is contributing to the symptoms, or another hidden disorder is the main cause of the symptoms, and that's what we're going to sort out. Finally, some persons not responding to surgery may have another underlying condition. And so if Chiari is not the primary culprit, what else could it be? Okay, that's the background. And now we could list a whole variety of disorders, actually. But these are some of the more common disorders that we have to keep in mind. Okay, we're going to go through these this evening. And the first we're going to start with is this long-term idiopathic intracranial hypertension. You might know the term hypertension, which means high blood pressure. We're going to talk about high pressure in your spinal fluid compartment, okay? That's why it's, and the name, the, uh, well, here's an example. This is a 38-year-old woman that came to me, and she'd had a Chiari decompression in the southeast, and it looks, she's got very good room. She still has headache, okay? and vision problems, and dizziness. Her decompression uh, had occurred a couple years before. No real improvement in the symptoms. This brain is full. This brain is generally swollen. There may be a pressure condition going on inside the brain. These fluid pockets in her brain are very small, so we've got a generalized tightness of the brain tissue. Okay? And this condition, you might have heard of it as pseudotumor cerebri, okay? It's a term that we still use, but this is more of the formal term. It's increased intracranial pressure of unknown cause, causes a variety of neurologic symptoms, especially headache and visual problems. Uh, of people who have pseudotumor, most will have a headache. It'll be diffuse and it can be worse in the morning. It can be worse with the straining, just like Chiari can be worse with coughing, sneezing, or straining. Uh, blurred vision, uh, they may have periods of graying out of vision lasting a few seconds. Those may occur if they're suddenly getting up with standing or with bending over. They may have some double vision. And they'll have this list of symptoms that I won't read to you. Overlaps Chiari symptoms quite a bit, doesn't it, when you kind of study it. Now, there are, there are suspicions as to why this condition may occur in some people, and I'll tell you uh, who it more often occurs in. Maybe the spinal fluid is not being absorbed as quickly as it's being made. We make spinal fluid with every heartbeat. It's a circulation system. You're pulsing. It's a, it's a beautiful filtrate of blood, basically. Inside those fluid pockets, there are tufts of blood vessels, and with each heartbeat, this is ultrafiltrate, which is the spinal fluid. It, it's created every heartbeat, and it has to drain, and has to be picked back up. If it doesn't get picked back up, you're going to back up your system, right? You're going to pressurize your system. So maybe it's a decreased absorption. Maybe there's some problems in the cerebrovasculature that allow increased brain water in the brain. Maybe that's what the condition is about. Or maybe the venous blood is not getting out of the brain easily, that means more stuff is up in there and things are swollen and tight and you have symptoms similar to the Chiari malformation. And we'll also talk about this new idea that maybe it's an inflammation, a chronic low-grade inflammation in the body and in the brain that results in the pressure change. Okay. Now, where do we see it? It's more common in overweight uh, women, uh, but um, be, if you take seriously overweight, 
then what's going to happen is there's increased intra-abdominal pressure, there's higher filling pressure in the heart, so this traffic that's coming down the veins, there's just too much of a traffic jam here. It's, it's, it backs up, okay? So there's some reasons that, that are being studied. It results in increased venous pressure. Uh, and we now know that especially the abdominal fat is what we call inflammatory. We can talk about this a little more later on. But we're now finding that this tissue can inflame the hypothalamus, it can inflame the astrocytes, it can inflame the cerebellum. Let me digress for a second. You know of one inflammatory condition. You've heard about it. You've heard about it in the news. You've maybe heard about it from family, maybe from friends, and maybe some of you might even have it. That's gluten allergy. Okay, gluten allergy, you've probably heard of that, or gluten sensitivity. It comes mostly from wheat, there are several other grains, okay? We all need to remember we were never designed to consume grains. We started doing it 10,000 years ago. We got shorter, we got sicker, but we kind of dealt with it because we developed civilization out of agriculture, right? But now some of us are fine, we're finding that some of us can't handle that protein and it inflames the gut. Celiac disease is your gut trying to inflame and protect you from having that abnormal protein come into your system and hurt your gut, right? Well now we're finding that protein affects the cerebellum, it affects, it causes a neuropathy, it causes spinal inflammation, causes cerebellar inflammation. It's what I'm talking about inflammations when we touch on it. Maybe abnormal proteins that are coming into the system and we can talk about that later on if you want. Um, so in general, about one per 100,000. Uh, it's more common in women, and if it's uh, overweight, then it does occur in men, and it does occur in thin folks, uh, but you can see the chances jump up almost 20 times the general population number. So we have to wonder what's going on. It can affect any age. The symptoms most commonly present in the third decade. Uh, affected children, interestingly, are not necessarily obese. It can occur in thin people, children, and men. But, but again, it's more common in women than men, so then is a hormone, is a hormone factor a play a role. So what are the neurologic findings? So, you know, some, we're concerned maybe somebody has pseudotumor. What are we going to look for in the clinical exam? Well, the problem with pseudotumor, or increased intracranial pressure, is people can lose their vision. And many years ago, before we had scans, that was the major way it was found. People were just losing their eyesight. The pressure was so high around the optic nerves that when the ophthalmologist looked at the back, it didn't look normal. This is a very abnormal swollen eye nerve. And it, go it goes along with their poor vision. Um, in a few cases, it has been reported uh, to be normal. There can be double vision in addition to visual loss. Now, interestingly, a number of things have been identified to cause it in certain people, and certain medications. We have a young, thin woman right now in this community who has clear Chiari malformation, crowded tonsils, a lot of symptoms, and pseudotumor cerebri at the age of about 16 or so. Okay? Uh, what was it? It was an acne medication, minocycline, okay, that caused the increased intracranial pressure. Now, interestingly, she still ended up needing to have Chiari treated. So here's an example of somebody with two conditions. We had to have two separate teams, the neuro-ophthalmology team and the neurosurgical team, to manage both conditions. And once she stopped the minocycline, her, her vision, her nerves started decreasing in their swelling, her headaches increased in her case. So again, we're dealing with two situations. These diseases, and I won't read them, also seem to be more associated. Disorders that are affecting the drainage of the veins, as we talked about, it could be obviously a tumor, it could be a narrowing or a thrombosis of the sinus, this is a narrowing here, and a few people who've had to have a lot of veins removed to try to remove a cancer in the neck may have that. Now, what is the relationship to uh, Chiari malformation? Well, in this study, uh, Dr. Frim um, looked at, well, there are two studies. One is an MRI of 68 patients 
10% in this study had uh, tonsils hanging down five millimeters or more. Now we don't think that the pseudotumor can cause those very sharp, deep drops in the tonsils, okay? But if somebody comes in with six to seven millimeters, then we have to wonder, why are those tonsils down there? Is it Chiari? Is it pseudotumor pushing them down? Or is it a combination of disorders? Dr. Frim looked at 36 of his patients who had not responded to a decompression for Chiari. And he did spinal taps on this group of patients. And 40%, 42% had high pressure. So there is a group of folks that may have Chiari and pseudotumor together. Okay, I know I'm covering a lot of material and I'll stop after this section and we can take some questions. What else do we do? We obviously have the visual, vision evaluated, the brain is evaluated, but a person may need a special brain MRI called an MRV to look at the veins to make sure there's no stenosis or narrowing. It's uncommon, but that might be something that would allow us to treat the person by trying to get rid of the narrowing. And then obviously the definitive test is a spinal tap to measure the pressure. If you or someone you know, uh, it, this may, condition may be a possibility, they have ongoing symptoms, then we can do a spinal tap. What about doing a spinal tap before Chiari surgery? Well, it's a little tricky. If the Chiari is quite crowded, a spinal tap there, you basically could aggravate the Chiari malformation. So it gets tricky to balance these things. Uh, now, there's a long list of medications. Probably the most common medication is the Dimox, okay? And um, uh, other treatments then are a CSF shunt. If, uh, if, you ha if a person has pseudotumor, no crowding back there, they, and um, they're thin, a shunt might be the treatment. You're, bypass, you're letting some of that spinal fluid through a spinal drain drain into the abdomen, trickle into the abdomen to lower their pressure, okay? Again, you don't want to do that in a Chiari situation because you're going to just pull the Chiari down further, okay? Now, if we find, and this is new information, there are three research papers this past year. If we find that in some people, the big draining veins, there's some narrowing there, they can run a stent up in there through a catheter in the groin and expand that vein and that can decrease symptoms in some people. This is new work in a few, this narrowing is coming back which leads some doctors to say we don't know if this is going to be a long-lasting benefit, but again it does document the fact that in some people the venous drainage is not good. Um, this is done when you can't save the vision in any other way. You can actually open up the membrane around the nerve to so it, the, the pressure doesn't squeeze on the nerve so, so much. Somebody that's losing their vision and you can't deal with it any other way. You all have heard of the BMI, the body mass index. It's your weight versus your height, okay? Um, above 30 is obesity as we define it in, in today's culture. Uh, above 35 is pretty significant. Um, the specialists that are working on pseudotumor are now saying that if it's above 35, if a person's body mass index is above 35, this is the treatment if they cannot lose weight. Okay? Weight loss is the, if, if a person's heavy, weight loss is the, the best treatment. It's just it takes quite a while to do that. Okay? But you can cure pseudotumor with loss of body mass, okay? And so now uh, this is being recommended if it's 35 or greater. Now, um, here's the shunting, and this is a new study that I added for, for your interest. This is just last year, because the typical treatment for pseudotumor, when we can, has been a shunt, and it can be effective. However, is it long-term effective? Okay, that's the question. Again, brand new information, 53 patients. Uh, the shunts were primarily the lower spinal shunts. Um, and, uh, you know, they fewer had problems with their vision. Uh, the pr so the vision results were pretty good. They didn't actually give us a number. But the headache, 79% at two years after surgery. So a shunt is not 
a long-term way to get the headache under control for most people. We've got to get rid of the pseudotumor. We've got to figure out why it's there, okay? Uh, and some of those with a shunt had low pressure headaches. And look at this. This is an issue. 51% of patients had a shunt revision and 30% had multiple revisions. Shunts can obstruct. They can get clogged. Uh, so although it uh, improves the visual situation, alternative treatments such as weight reduction may be more effective and less associated uh, morbidity. So in summary, it's a syndrome of increased intracranial pressure. Again, most often uh, in women childbearing age that are obese, but may occur in thin, in thin people, children, and men. Various causes are suspected, can be cured by weight loss if the person is obese. Medical and surgical treatments are available uh, and provide varying success. Since I've got a handful of topics today, I was going to take a few minutes after each just to make sure that it's clear and, and that there are, because these are complex subjects and that there are no questions at the present time. Any thoughts or questions right now? So again, it's a condition that can uh, go hand in hand. Sometimes it's the major condition. Sometimes the Chiari is the major condition. We just all have to be aware of it, okay? And, all, right. all right, well, we talked about hypertension. Now this, fortunately, is less common, okay? And, and the headache's going to be different enough that we should be able to pick it up, okay? There's a little less worry here because you're going to complain or a person's going to complain of somewhat different type of headache. And this is a low pressure headache. And a low pressure headache is a bad headache. And you get a variety of other system, uh, symptoms. If your pressure is low, you're not going to feel well at all, okay, for the most part. It's a postural headache is one of the key issues. You've, one man who told me, thin man, uh, his secretary would walk in the, his office, he was lying on the floor. He was lying on the floor. That's when the headache was okay. He stood up, his headache was miserable, okay? So it's a, you, at least when it develops, it's usually a postural headache. Again, worse when you're up, okay? And it can be diffuse or localized. It can be throbbing or non-throbbing. Involves usually both sides of the head. And yes, it's worse with some of those straining uh, situations. And um, a few cases have been described where headache is not the key issue, but they found it by a low pressure when they did a spinal tap. And again, I can't read all this, but you can see it's a syndrome with many symptoms. And let me highlight this right here, okay? My son had this condition briefly, okay? He was feeling ill one, uh, I think it was Friday night. Um, he'd been pushing himself. He called me, he was feeling febrile, uh, just poor and ill. And a young college student, or just beyond college, goes into the ER, what are they gonna get? in that situation, they're going to get a spinal tap and worry about meningitis. And he had a spinal tap and he didn't have meningitis and he was dehydrated and he, uh, he did fine from his, major, his main problem, but Saturday night, awful. He called me, Dad, my, my, my head's not working well. I've got a terrible headache and I see some nodding here as though people have, and he just, he just didn't sound right. I said, you get to the emergency department. And this is at the University of Missouri was where I was at. And yes, I did call the ER and let them know my son was coming in <laughs> and find out who the anesthesiologist was. <laughs> Fortunately, he was the head of the department. I said, I think, I think he's got a spinal fluid leak. And uh, sure enough, he had a spinal fluid leak. His, pre his spinal fluid was leaking out of the sac through the needle hole that had not repaired. He was standing up. He was drip dripping inside his muscle tissues, and that's a low pressure headache, and it makes you feel quite sick. And fortunately, there's a pretty effective treatment. They draw blood out of your vein, they inject it down there to seal the hole. It's called a blood patch, okay? Uh, so let's move on. Uh, peak onset in general, a bit more common in women, not as much as the other condition. Some folks have the Erla Danlos syndrome, connective tissue diseases. Uh, and Chiari patients might be a bit more susceptible, but it also may be that they have more EDS. That hasn't been sorted out. Minor trauma, maybe there's weakness of the sac itself, the dura. Many cases we don't know where the cause of the leak, if you will, is. 
Some people can get low pressure for dehydration. Few, few are going to be obviously in diabetic coma, but there are conditions. Um, is there a history of trauma or connective tissue disease or Chiari or a recent spinal tap or spinal anesthesia or an epidural block? Anything that could nick the dura and cause an internal leak. We're going to do a brain MRI and usually a spinal tap, it'll be less than six centimeters of low pressure. Fortunately, the MRI with contrast shows thickening and this dura here shouldn't be bright like it is here and that's a sign of low pressure. It may resolve on its own over time. Um, so, some, you know, for years people are just treated with bed rest and fluids. Caffeine and theophylline can improve the headache. Uh, some people have had success with carbon dioxide inhalation and steroid therapy plus or minus. But the idea is if you can find out where the leak might be coming from and you can do a number of studies here, the o if there is a leak, the overwhelming majority is in the spine. Somewhere in the spine there's been a little bleb that developed and usually where it happens is you've got the spinal column and at every level, as we call it, one of the nerves is coming out. And that has a little bit of the sac. The sac has to fuse and fade into nerves, okay? So the sac doesn't go all the way around nerves, right? But it has to punch out of the sac and head into your body, right? That's a weak spot in some people. So sometimes there can be a little bleb in that area that pops, and that's where the headache comes from, okay? Um, you can, if you find the leak, you can inject blood into it, just like you do at a spinal tap. You pretty well should know where the spinal tap was done. In surgery, uh, only if you identify the leak, but here's uh, from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, they wrap this little muscle, uh, if you can, around the nerve, because these are hard to sew directly. It's a very weak This is the spinal sac here. This is the nerve. So they're going to lay some muscle around it. Uh, and uh, try to trap it off that way and let it scar in, okay? So that's hypotension, postural headache is one of the key differences. Multiple symptoms that can look like Chiari, so we have to think through, et cetera. Now this syndrome is interesting, and, and really there's an overlap with Chiari. Not everyone with Chiari has an empty cella, and I'm going to describe that for you. On the other hand, it's not unusual to see empty cella more often in people with Chiari than people without Chiari. So I think this is an area for, for future work. We need more work here. I think these are their clues in this disorder that we should be pursuing. So what is an empty cella? Well, um, years ago, people would come in with bad headaches and, oh my gosh, you know, maybe you have a tumor. They do a scan or they do an x-ray, a CT scan, and this area, which is called the cella, where the pituitary gland lives, looked empty. By the way, that's a flattened gland. This is an empty cella situation. It's about 5%, again, more common in women. So this is the cella, and I'll tell you where it gets its name. It's that little compartment there. Your pituitary gland hangs off the hypothalamus and sits down in your skull like that. Okay? That's just, and here's a, an MRI. This person happens to have a Chiari and a syrinx, and fortunately her uh, pituitary is okay. There's no empty cella in this person here, okay? This is a Turkish saddle, okay? This is a Turkish, I know, it's kind of like, wait a minute, how did you get here? <laughs> I lost you somewhere, okay? I lost you somewhere. This is a Turkish saddle, and tersica is for Turkish, and cella is for saddle, and so saddle, cella tersica, it was the name they gave it because that area of the, let me maybe go back, it on bony anatomy, it sort of looks like a saddle. I mean, we'll just have to take it for that, okay? Uh, and it may occur without you. Some people have an empty cella and they don't have any symptoms from it, okay? But again, this has not been well studied. On the other hand, uh, in some studies, a high percentage may have headache. A chronic, it can be chronic, often on one side, moderate, or maybe usually in the front of the, they can have visual problems, they can have problems with their hormones because it's the pituitary, and um, if, since we think in some people it's caused by pressure, it can eventually, especially where the smell nerves are that sit above our nose and the membrane is weak there, they can have spinal fluid leaking out their nose, okay? 
All right, so let's look at some of the work. Uh, and this is 2005. 142 people, more common in women, mean age was 43, 88% had headache, high pressure in almost 80% from 19 to 35. You'd rather be about 20 or below. These are, that's a high number in this study, then you can't say that most people have asymptomatic or without symptoms cella. So my argument is when you see a cella, yet yes, it may be asymptomatic and not cause any problem, but it's up to us to make sure, especially if they have neurologic problems, because that's a fairly high in these studied patients. Okay? Here's another study, 213 patients, again, more common in women, mean age in this study, 52. Endocrine problems, 20%, 48, headache, visual disturbance, uh, dizziness, et cetera. The body mass index above, this is overweight, not obese, 73%. Over uh, 30, uh, um, 30 kilograms, there were 15% in the group, uh, women, 12% men. So there's, there, what I'm trying to say is there may be some association, again, with body mass in some people, okay? Now, there are other reasons to get it. You could have a brain tumor that causes uh, the pressure. Uh, a, I won't read through the list. Chiari and our friend that we just talked about, pseudotumor, okay? So what do you see here? Bone at the back of the skull, it ends there. Bone at the base of the skull, it ends there. Everybody would agree that's a Chiari malformation. This is the cerebellum brainstem there's a pretty darn empty cella. So if we're going to fix this and we know how to fix it, why don't we pay attention to that? Do we need endocrine workups? Uh, do we need to pursue this? Is this truly asymptomatic? Okay. And what we do is an MRI and there's an anchor sign. And in the front shot, that looks like an anchor. This should be, a, what should be in here, this is the stem coming off the brain to the pituitary. The pituitary is squashed and flattened and it's called an anchor sign, okay? Uh, diagnosis, we do the hormonal studies, we have the ophthalmologist, and then the question is, do we do a spinal tap to see if there's associated pressure? Well, how do we treat? Uh, if it's mild and it's headache, we might uh, use analgesics, uh, maybe amitriptyline has been uh, recommended for depression. If the gland is not working and you're secreting too much hormone of prolactin, which makes your menses irregular and can secrete breast milk, we can use uh, one of these medications. If it's severe, if there's a leak, it has to be repaired. If the pressure is high, we may need a shunt. And if the, the eye nerves, the worst thing that can happen in this condition is not only is spinal fluid pushing the pituitary down, but the eye nerves sink down there. And some people can have really bad uh, vision, and they have to go in and do, it's very unusual, do a lift-up procedure for the eye nerve so the vision will stabilize. I see some nodding there. <laughs> okay. All right. So again, I, to me, this is a condition that we don't talk a lot about. We, it's associated with Chiari, but there's no large Chiari study that I'm aware of that tells us how many people with Chiari have empty cella. Uh, again, we just need to be alert to it. And, you know, if somebody's having ongoing issues, you might want to relook at your scan and ask for an opinion about your pituitary gland. We may need to send you to the endocrinologist. If you're decompressed here, then you could have a spinal tap. We may need to measure your pressure. Okay. Now, this is probably one of the more common issues that people deal with with Chiari malformation. It's occipital neuralgia, so we'll spend some time on that. And... Um, the, the whole back of the head is fed by the occipital nerves. Uh, there are three branches on either side, and they basically uh, feed all the way up into this area, okay? Um, and the pain is a prolonged ache or a feeling of tightness. It can be throbbing or electric shock-like. It can start in the upper neck, uh, goes to the back of the head. It can radiate behind the ears temples, forehead, or eyes. So it radiates forward a lot like a Chiari headache can often do, radiating forward, excuse me. It may be just on one side or both sides. The scalp can be tender, and sometimes it's actually markedly tender to palpation in the area. What are the causes? Some people could get irritation of the nerve from trauma. 
Uh, one lady, a nurse at our previous at the university where I was at, uh, was pulling into a parking lot, a shopping area, and when she turned like this is when she got rear-ended and she hit the side, her driver's window here, and her uh, occipital neuralgia was quite marked. Her initial treatment was Lyrica or Neurontin. This kind of pain doesn't respond very well to narcotics and anti-inflammatories. Okay? Her second treatment uh, was occipital nerve blocks numb the area up and see if the pain will settle down. And the third treatment I'll explain to you in just a little bit. So blunt trauma, uh, you can have tight neck muscles and eventually pinch the nerves. I have a man right now, or at least last year, who uh, has it on both sides. He's an older man, he's a welder, he wears his hair very short, and he's pretty miserable. And you can see the cause just by looking at his scalp. He's worn his welder's helmet so many years that he's got a dent along his scalp where the welder's helmet thing is. And I uh, finally, when we worked everything up, I said, there's your problem. And so now they've made him a wider pad to distribute that, but he's pressurizing on those uh, occipital nerves in his routine work, okay? So uh, different causes. Now, it can, those occipital nerves, come out of the high neck, okay, C1, C2, area and uh, so it may be that the nerves in the high neck if you develop arthritis up in that area might be pinched there and maybe the block should be done done in that area which is a little more involved block but pain specialists can do it with x-rays or rarely obviously you could have a tumor in that area or you could have infection gout diabetes and sometimes it inflames nerves and irritates nerves. These conditions can. So what do you do? Well, if it's mild, maybe heat, rest, yes, maybe you can try anti-inflammatories at that time. Muscle relaxants just to relax the nerves, uh, the muscles. You avoid tight bands, okay? Some of these young men that love to wear their ball cap all the time and have occipital neuralgia, they hate to give up that ball cap, but you know, they may need to think about it. Um, but as we talked about, these are the two medications uh, we usually go to. If those, if people can't tolerate those or they're not effective, we may go to occipital nerve blocks. And here's just one illustration trying to, this is done outpatient, trying to give you a cortisone shot with Novocaine or Lidocaine. Even if you only get a couple of days relief, you then have a better idea where your pain is coming from. Okay, so it's helpful to diagnose the, the pain. Now this, this doesn't help everybody, okay? And so there's an advanced treatment that maybe we've seen, we see people from all over, they sometimes have had one or more Chiari surgeries, and even some folks that I've treated are bothered with uh, occipital neuralgia. This is an advanced treatment, and it, it has, I think I've had five or six patients have this treatment. Okay, so, and we can talk about it. Um, but we, uh, you, you can have a stimulator implanted on the nerve itself. Now, they're not going to put a permanent one of these in unless you respond to a temporary one, okay? Um, and the classic case that I have to discuss with you is a lady who had had Chiari malformation two years before I moved here at the end of 05 and she had ongoing symptoms, uh, in particular headache. And she was treated with Lyrica that she couldn't either tolerate or it didn't last. She was treated with blocks. They were only temporarily effective. Her story's available online. I can point you to where that's available if you'd like. She decided to have a temporary one put in. She writes on her report online, this little device was my miracle. I decided to have uh, the permanent one put in. I was off of work for seven to 10 days. I am now five months out from my stimulator. I am 90% headache pain free. Now, interestingly, and I've explained this uh, situation to maybe some of you in the room. Interestingly, this was, you know, 2006 is probably when I saw her. And we got a request from a totally different issue. We got a letter from her uh, December of last year, and she says, oh, by the way, 
My stimulator is wonderful, and I recommend it to wherever I can. Okay. Now, we've only had, she's got a strong response, and not everyone gets that strong response. And there aren't that many folks in the country that are knowledgeable about this technology. But if, if occipital neuralgia is an issue, then we can assist and guide you to try to find someone who's knowledgeable, hopefully closer to your area, because that means trips and visits. And let me just, everything has a bit of a downside, okay? You can get the stimulator put in, it, there's a lead underneath the skin, and there's a little pack here just like a pacemaker. You've probably seen the size of a pacemaker, it's fairly flat. What's the downside? You can't have an MRI, okay? So that, now, there may be, there's some talk that they're going to have some MRI compatible ones, so, you know, it's possible that that may change soon. Uh, but that's uh, occipital neuralgia, okay? Okay. All right. So we're going to go into our last condition, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, another reason to have headache, you know, doctor, it starts in my neck, and then it goes up to the back of my head. Well, maybe the headache's coming from the neck itself. And we in medicine like to make up terms so people don't really understand us very well. <laughs> and it's like a code. And we call it cervicogenic headache. Headache that's coming from your neck, okay? That's basically all that means. Uh, pain originates in the neck but is referred to the head. It can go to the occipital, the temporal, around the eyes, one or both sides. Dull, non-throbbing, non-lancinating. In other words, it's not necessarily a sharp pain like some occipital neuralgia can be. Uh, worse with neck movement and poor posture. One study thought about two and a half uh, percent of the population has headache based on problems in their neck. Interestingly, of course, the high nerves in the neck, this blue area is cervical two and cervical three. So if you've got pressure on that nerve there, you're going to have an occipital headache, okay? Uh, if you have stimulant irritation to C3-4, you can get a headache in this area. C4-5 can go to the occiput. And interestingly, although in this diagram, C5-6 is shown here, when um, you inject some patients in the disc itself, there's a study called discography where they put a needle in the cervical disc. There is actually a way to do that fairly safely and you pressurize the disc trying to find the site of pain. And some of those folks report headaches. So even down to C5-6 in some people can cause headache is what I'm trying to say. Um, so that's why we also want to look at the cervical MRI. We want to look at the discs and disc degeneration, nerve pressures, okay? I have some folks that maybe have done well for two or three years, think their Chiari symptoms are back. What do we often find? Degenerative discs, pinched nerves, okay? And again, what happens is we dry out our discs. You know, it's one shock that we're given to last us for a lifetime, right? Well, not just one, multiple shocks. Okay? And they dry. And if we have trauma, they're going to get injured and degenerate a little quicker, right? And some of us maybe have a little more family history than others, okay? And that disc, the pad, can wear out quite a bit, build spurs and push nerves, basically, or Somebody can get into a whiplash, okay, and bang a nerve and irritate a nerve or begin a process of arthritis around a nerve. And so we have a nerve compression. We do a neuro examination. Uh, we palpate the head also for tenderness. We might compress on the head, moderate, not severe, to see if putting a little pressure on those nerves irritates. Uh, Dr. Sperling graduated from the University of Missouri in the 1930s, and it took his name, and he found a very clever test. Look, those little nerve canals are made up of the vertebra above and the vertebra below, okay? And if obviously that disc wears, this is going to get shorter, okay? And if you want to pinch your nerve in your neck, then you go back, you might be able to pinch them, or go back to the side that you're having pain. And if somebody says, oh, don't do that, doctor, you apologize is what you do immediately after that, right? <laughs> I'm so sorry we had to do this. <laughs> um, and, but that's a very helpful test. There's really one thing that you're changing, and that is 
The nerve is it's coming out that little nerve canal. Okay, so it's a very sensitive and, and helpful test to sort out. Um, and then some people, if they really have a lot of arthritis on the spinal cord, may get a shock-like sensation down their spine, and that's what that is referring to. Okay, so uh, this person is not uh, treated or have Chiari malformation, but they're coming in with occipital headaches. Okay, uh, it gets worse during the day. Uh, just a lot of pain and pressure in the back. This spine is out of balance. It doesn't look terrible. I mean, this person has reasonably tall discs, so it's not like an advanced age situation where we get a little shorter and we develop the arthritis. Sorry for the bad news and all. But, um, uh, but this spine is out of balance. And what I want you to think about is that we were all born with a C-shaped curve that looks like that. It's about, about like my hands looking. Okay? And, and guess what? The head is quite heavy on a fairly narrow neck. So if we've got our curvature, we're balanced. It's not that much work for us to keep our heads up. Now imagine if those discs dry and we start angling forward. Your head is always leaned forward. These neck muscles are always holding you back. And eventually, you're going to get worn out. And there's going to be headache and neck pain. So the problem in her situation, her curve, if we follow this part, which is normal, her head should probably be ending up here, or her spine. Do you see what I'm saying? Let me go over here a little, a little easier. Yeah, you can see it. Ignore that leaning tower for a minute. This is the curve, and if we follow this, the curve should end up somewhere there. You see what I'm saying? It's hard to do with a pointer, okay? Instead, the tower is leaning especially at this disc. It's protruding, it's bulging. She's bulging here as well, okay? So this is leaning forward. So the cause of this person's headache is actually the neck. And when it's severe, I don't recall, I don't think we have treated, but if it's severe and people are miserable, we'll actually go in from the front, clean out the bad discs, try to get the neck back up straight, and do a fusion, okay? It's not very common, but in severe cases, it's about uh, the only thing that we can do other than just medications, etc. Non-steroidals, physical therapy, sometimes injections, sometimes steroids into the, into the joint areas, and this pain specialist, if a block to a specific worn out joint is helping you and it doesn't last long, they may put in a heating probe, a radio frequency probe, and knock out those little nerves in the joint itself. Okay, and we can debate the pros and cons of that, but certainly some people have uh, this procedure. And again, if it's severe, unrelenting, you really can't get good control with these other therapies, we can consider a surgical procedure if we have a good idea where we believe the pain may be coming from. And now I'm really kind of winding up, and we'll leave some time for discussion. Let me just review these uh, things a little bit. Um, there's a whole other group of disorders that can overlap with symptoms with Chiari malformation. Uh, obviously, you can't go through it. But some people that are on chronic narcotics for a very long period of time, that, per that perpetuates the pain. And the treatment is really getting off the narcotics. It sounds counterintuitive that the narcotics themselves can cause the pain. But that's what it is called. It's analgesia rebound. It's from the medication. There's this uh, condition of chronic fatigue syndrome. And uh, a lot of debate about this, but that's another disorder that can have problems with thinking, fatigue, memory, headaches, feeling poorly. Uh, there's the Ehlers-Danlos that we've just talked about. There, if the joints are very lax in the elbows and the knees and in other areas, maybe the skull on top of the cervical spine is a bit lax. And that's a complex disorder. We had to have a whole conference from a variety of different specialists, and there's still work to be done to get a handle on, on that relationship. You've heard of fibromyalgia. Uh, again, a lot of work's being done. There's some medications that are now, that are sort of like uh, Lyrica, uh, that can help some people. Of course, multiple sclerosis can cause all kinds of varied symptoms as well, right? So we have to uh, keep alert for those possibilities. Um, so sleep dysfunction, just protect your sleep. 
If somebody's pushing you, and obviously there are always times when we have to be up late. You're going to travel, and that's just the way it is, and whatever, okay? Or somebody's ill in the family, and we have to be up. But if you don't, if it's more social, you're the one in the group that says, uh, -uh time out. I love my sleep, okay? I just love my sleep. And uh, I wish I had the whole details. This is a brand new study. And basically, it's sleep deprivation causes an overexcitability of the neurons. The neurons can't clean themselves out for the new activity and the new learning. So if we deprive those neurons, we're in a state of hyperexcitability as far as the nervous. We're sensitive to too much. We can't filter out what's coming into the nervous system. So again, we're learning more about the very high value of sleep. And I'll just finish by touching on this area happens to be a special interest of mine, and that is nutrition and health. And I'll just touch on it. It's not a lecture about nutrition, but the short version is that we decided as people to move away from the natural diet that we evolved on. And uh, bottom line is Homo sapiens is believed to be about 190,000 to 200,000 years old, okay? That's your family, your ancestors. And 10,000 years ago, which is relatively recent, we decided to chunk away the, the original human diet, and we started eating grains in particular. And there's no question that that led to society. I'm not going to argue that. We're all part of it, and I don't want to get rid of society. I love my cell phone, et cetera, et cetera, OK? The problem is, is that maybe more of us are sensitive to what's coming into our body. So if I see someone that's significantly overweight or obese, I don't think of it, it's not a problem with free will. And I know there'll be some in the audience to debate with me, but there's a good study from the 60s of the percentage of men and women with obesity versus today, okay? And basically the line is like that, I think most people realize. So if you tell me it's free will, did our, your mothers, my mothers, have better will? Did we lose our free will in, in a short generation? Is that the answer? Can you just say, well, you just need to try harder? No, that's false. The companies would like us to believe it's free will because they don't have to take any responsibility. Okay? And it's really the low quality of fuel that we are consuming. And what I would leave to you is, this is a newly developing area, and I would leave to you is inquire about it, learn about it, keep your eyes open, uh, keep in mind that uh, if some of us have health problems, we may actually be initiating the health problems without knowing it. And again, I can take some questions if you want on that area. I don't want to take too much time on that. Um, well, I do have a few slides. Okay, forgot about this. Um, all right, December 2010, okay? not too long ago. This is one of the two top science journals in the world. Probably Nature is number one. In Britain it started way back when with Isaac Newton probably, okay? So, insights of the decade, okay? And they num named a bunch of them. The only one I'm going to bring to you is inflammation, what I've been talking about, and I'll just be short about it. Over the past decade it has become widely accepted that inflammation is the driving force behind chronic diseases that will kill nearly all of us. Cancer, diabetes, obesity, Alzheimer's, atherosclerosis. Here inflammation wears a grim mask, shedding its redeeming features, making sick people sicker. We need a certain amount of inflammation. If I get a splinter, I want inflammation to go in there and fight that, wall it off, and get rid of it, okay? The problem is, is we're over-inflamed, which means a number of us are low, have low chronic grade inflammation, and that's not going to make us well, okay? Uh, and what does it affect now? This is, there's now research evidence that it can inflame the frontal lobes of the brain, and the question is, is it related to Alzheimer's? It can affect the hypothalamus, and interestingly in the study they did of the hypothalamus, it, knocks, it affects the circuits that regulate feeding. So you're kind of damaging the thermostat, okay? It inflames the astrocytes that support the cells. It causes inflammation of the cerebellum. 
It causes inflammation of the spinal um, ganglion, spinal cord, and nerves. The typical diet is five to ten times more inflammatory than the ancestral diet, which is nowadays known as the paleo diet, the diet of our ancestors. Okay? Again, this is a new area. There's still a lot of debate. I'll just mention briefly what it is, and, uh, and there it is. It's not fancy, okay? It's not fancy. And the more we lean to that, my gut sense is, from what I've been following for a number of years, is we're going to do better overall. So you want to up these, decrease those other products that we never really were designed to eat. Conclusion. Uh, again, many people, 84% or so, can uh, have significant improvement in the quality of their life with a posterior fossa decompression. So, although I've laid out these other conditions for you, keep in mind that many people can do quite well. Some people might have an overlapping disorder, and then we have to work and help out with that. But sometimes the Chiari is not the main cause. If someone still has symptoms following decompression, another disorder needs to be looked for. And again, now is the time to protect your future health. Thank you. I'll take some questions. I don't know how long we're going uh, to. We have some time. Yes. When you were explaining the uh, misaligned spine. Yes. And that woman had a disc, but it, I don't know what disc it was. Sure. So if you had a disc, Farther down in the middle of your back, that would. I mean, in a, in, anywhere, anywhere in that spine, it would seem to me that if you're misaligned. No, I actually that's that that expands in my discussion, and I, I appreciate that. That's exactly right. I, when I see people with neck pain, one of the first things I ask them to do is take care of their lower back. This is the foundation. The rest of the spine reflects off of that. You're exactly right. A pinch and a curve. Again, more often, of course, problems in the back are going to pinch the nerves heading down. Problems here are going to... But the bottom line is somebody with chronic neck pain that maybe has poor posture, they may have poor posture because they've lost their support around their abdomen to hold them right. And uh, there's a lot of science to that. Um, and uh, I think some of you will find that most chairs you sit on are a little too tall for you. Okay, because if your thighs are not at 90 degrees to your spine, then the chair's too tall and your legs are like that. Okay, that puts your back out of alignment where it should be, puts your neck out of alignment, and it's going to be a hard position to sit in for a long time. Now, the fix is not to do as our mothers asked us to do, is sit up straight, watch your posture. We just can't do that all the time, maybe when mom's around, but otherwise. The fix to that, if you can, it's hard to get a smaller chair, right? The fix to that is get something up under your feet. Get your feet lifted up. Get this right angle degree here. You get that round back in your back, and now your neck is in neutral position. I think a lot of us are like this on computer screens, okay? That's hard on our neck all day long. And uh, even the ergonomics uh, people that come into your offices and set up. Keep in mind, if you wear bifocals like I do, I'm not going to be reading straight. I'm reading down. I don't want that screen straight. I want it down. Okay? So kind of, you know, we, we need to, especially now that we sit a lot in front of computers, we just need to keep some of those things in mind. But you're exactly right. The whole spine is, is, is important. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, when you talk about the inflammation, do you mostly by diet, you're referring to like refined sugars and gluten and the uh, gluten? Yeah, well, um, gluten is the tip of the iceberg. I use it because we know more about that. Uh, the interest right now in some of the early research is that, um, uh, as a matter of fact, some of the top nutritionists now are saying that we misled people by getting them scared of fat. They drop their fat down and they over, now we're having these carbohydrates. And now we're knowing that the worst cholesterol, the very small, dense cholesterol, what drives that up? Carbs. Carbs. And so it's, it's sort of disorienting because, I mean, we've locale, locale, locale. Now it's get the right kinds of fat. Well, as a matter of fact, we all know 
what to worry about in a very high cholesterol. You know, we're worried about our arteries and stroke and, and heart, right? What are we worried about with low cholesterol? Does anybody talk to us about low cholesterol? Uh -uh. We're worried about depression and suicide. Brain's got to have cholesterol. So if you, have a, if you know of a young person that just seems moody and depressed for no particular reason, look at what they're eating. Think about what they're eating. We've really gotten off track. We grew up to eat lean meats, fruits, vegetables, nuts, berries, and fish because then we got the balance we needed. And our carbs are not going to fix that. So obviously you can see I can carry on <laughs> on this topic uh, because it's, it's really quite a concern. The Alzheimer's Association says one out of eight of us is going to have dementia. They have a fairly wide definition. They're including minimal cognitive dysfunction. That's unacceptable. If we look at hunter-gatherers as best we know, and they've been studied, 2,500 have been studied in Catawba in New Guinea that still live hunter-gatherer. Dementia is not a problem in aging. We've accepted it. We've kind of been led to believe what's just going to happen. The in evidence that's developing is, no, that's probably not correct. And so the question is, what are we doing beginning in our 40s probably? We think some sense that these are 20, 30 year processes. It's a slow chronic insult. And the last thing I'll say, and I'll stop, there is an actual blood test for some inflammation. It's called the CRP. Some of you might know of that test. And there's an excellent study where they looked at 447 people. That's a fairly large study. Their average age was 63, so you know the population group now. They ruled out people with a stroke because it would just confuse the study. So they looked at these 447 people, average age 63. They drew uh, a lab test for inflammation. Okay? They then took those with the highest inflammation and the lowest inflammation and scanned them in an MRI. These brains were a number of years older than these brains. So this brain loss and atrophy that we've all been told that's just what happens in aging may be related to inflammation. Okay? So there's some evidence uh, saying that, you know what? I want to, as I told one lady, and it finally got across to her, you know, uh, if, you, uh, if you want an executive mind, you have to have an executive diet. Don't accept any fuel. If you are in the parking lot and you see someone with a gallon of water putting that gallon in their car, they're going to look like a fool. They're, you're going to think, well, what is that? We tend to do that to uh, ourselves. We tend to accept what we've allowed in our own culture. And I, and I don't want to overdo it. I mean, there are people that live to 97, 100, and they've smoked all their life, okay? And God bless them, and, you know, hopefully we're all in that category, that, that it doesn't matter. But I happen to see folks that are having a variety of problems. We can help a lot of them, at least our studies seem to suggest that. But we know there's more we can do to help. And that's really the reason that I'm interested in this, because the evidence is evolving. And, uh, and we hope as we go along that we'll have more solid information that can help more people. Yes? Okay, so Dr. Oral, let me ask you something because it seems like week after week we're hearing something about meats. Don't eat the meat, don't eat the red meat, don't eat the lean meat, don't eat this, don't eat that. Only eat 10 pistachios a week, only eat this. You it's know, hard, so it's very hard. And I, I, I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Stephanie. It's very hard. Now, you go to a bookstore and you're going you're gonna to start a diet, right? You decided, okay, I'm going to start a diet. This is what I did in 2003. All right, fine, I'm going to learn about, I used to worry about it when I was young, middle career, we just put it off, we got, we're too busy. We're going to eat what's available and wherever it is, et cetera, et cetera, right? 2003, I went to the bookstore and I picked up a book. It was called The Paleo Diet. It was by a top professor in Fort Collins, interestingly, in Colorado itself, who's been studying this for many, many years. Now there are quite a number of researchers. And, and why did I pick that book out of all these other books, okay? Because now I'm going to get into evolution, and that might step on some toes, and I, and I, I have great respect for life in all its aspects, so keep that in mind. 
But before Darwin, evolution made no sense. Where did this creature come from? Where did that creature come from? It just it seemed to be no way to tie it together. After Darwin, we're related to all life on Earth. It's just unbelievable, okay? And we can sort of see that. It finally made sense. We finally had a foundation from which to understand all this different information that came out. We always looked, and does it fit? How does it fit? And then we usually could get the answer. Diet is the same way. We've got some people leading us this way, some people leading us that way, some people saying low fat, some people saying high fat. It's just overwhelming. I can't sort it out. I'm a physician. I was supposed to be trained in this, right? How many physicians really had nutrition in medical school? Okay. Um, so, what about if we decide to look at diet from what we evolved in? If we are about 200,000 years old, then we have, we evolved on a diet that was rich in the right kind of fats, the right kind of lean meats, uh, vegetables and fruits. And by the way, those fruits and vegetables were much better quality than we have nowadays. Much more fiber, 10 to 20 times the fiber. We think we get high fiber cereal, it's minimal compared to what our ancestors really had, okay? So when a study like that comes out, then now we have a foundation. Let's look at it evolutionarily wise. And then you can actually pull that study apart. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but basically it was an observational study. Okay, we have to keep that in mind. In other words, there's no proof or... I know the press, the press likes to take it to the top, okay? But basically, it's just an association. Then when you look at how often they reported, these people were followed for many years, okay? They had to report what they ate every four years. You had to write down what you ate over the past four years, okay? So the data gathering was very poor. And we also know that even if you checked every week, you're going to forget about that hot fudge sundae. You're going to not put that down. I mean, it's just some of it's just human nature. So it's actually the weakest science. It is a start, but it is the weakest science. The final thing then is you look at what they called meats. A lot of it was hamburger, okay? Which, and then, interestingly, they didn't measure the bun. The bun is very fine carbohydrate. It'll shoot your sugar up like that. It'll just eventually really hurt the pancreas. That's not even study. So the bottom line is more work needs to be done. It doesn't throw us off that have seen the benefit of how people that really do this natural approach, if you will, can lose weight, get better sleep, think better. At least that's what the information is showing. Let me give you one final brief study, and you've got to stop me on this topic, okay? <laughs> I'm serious. I think these ladies know you've got to stop me on this topic. I, well, I've got a lecture coming up on this. So let's take Australian Aborigines, okay? We're going to take 10 of them. They're born in the outback. They grew up as children and young adults in the outback. The rest of their life is in modern culture, okay? They all have type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a bad disorder. We can manage it, but it's wrecking a pancreas. And there's a lot of negative things that the people are at risk for with type 2 diabetes, and we sort of allow it in our culture, okay? All these 10 Australian Aborigines had type 2 diabetes, okay? The investigator said, the investigator said, would you guys be willing to live in the outback for seven weeks? They all agreed. They went back, they remembered how they ate, etc. They ate kangaroo, they ate this, they ate, they ate pretty much what was out there. I remember the whole list, fish. They all got rid of their type 2 diabetes. Glucose tolerance, normal. Diabetes type 2 is a modern disease. I'm not the only one saying it. Our CDC says two-thirds of uh, healthcare problems are preventable chronic diseases. In other words, they're modern diseases. And modern diseases Although they're not all diet, some of it's pollution, some of it's this and that and the other, okay, but probably a high number are diet. Our health care bill and our lack of competitiveness nationally in part is due to the fact that we're not taking care of ourselves. And again, I better stop. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you.